Today we will discuss the concept of high soluble analogy. The problem that we have in organometallic chemistry or even inorganic chemistry is a fact that we do not have the same systematization that is available in organic chemistry. So, a concept of isolable analogy was introduced by Professor Old Hoffman and this analogy allows one to understand a variety of organometallic compounds, structures and sometimes the reactivity. Primarily, the structures are explained extremely well using the isolable analogy. So, let us just develop this concept in the following few slides. If you look at organic structures, you notice that there are different functional groups. These functional groups can be transformed in a fairly systematic manner in a wide range of compounds. So, you could think of for example, a ketone which is present in an organic structure which can be present in a very different scenario in a cyclic molecule and it would behave very similar to the ketone which is present here in this linear acyclic form. And these groups are replaceable in a systematic fashion also. So, if I have two hydrogens which are present on this carbon, each one of them can be replaced by any R group which is a univalent radical. Similarly, a CH 2 group can be replaced by an oxygen and so on. So, this type of systematization is unfortunately not available in, in inorganic chemistry, whereas in organic chemistry you have a systematic replacement that can easily explain a wide range of compounds and it would be nice if we can do this for transition metal chemistry and organometallic chemistry. So, that is really the goal and we will see how far we can succeed in this particular venture. There are indeed common fragments. If you look at organometallic compounds in general, you find that there are common fragments like the cyclopentadienyl fragment which is highlighted for you or for example, the, the iron cyclopentadienyl group that is pictured here in yellow. And you can have these groups such as MnCO3 or MCO3, a metal with three, ca three carbonyl groups. So, these are recurring fragments. And so, if one can in a systematic way replace them in different molecules, just like we can do it in organic fragments, it would be nice. Now, how did we form the organic fragments? If you really want to go back to how one can think of fragments, you are normally looking at the C1 fragment and the saturated variety at that. So, that is methane and we systematically remove hydrogens one by one in order to generate a variety of molecules or fragments, which can be used as groups that can be plugged in in a molecule. So, you have the alkyl group, which is the methyl radical here and you can also have the methylene group and the methane group and so on. So, let us take a look at the inorganic fragment and see if we can do such a plucking of groups, so that we can arrive at different fragments. So, let us take hexacarbonyl chromium and that is like a typical octahedral fragment that is available in inorganic chemistry, an organometallic variety of the inorganic icon, an octahedral metal complex. Let us remove one by one and then we get these various fragments of a five coordinated metal atom, a four coordinated metal atom and so on. And when it comes to three and two or even four, we tend to have or we can have a variety of geometries, but nevertheless these fragments can they be used as the fragments that we encountered in organic chemistry can we have a kind of a mapping of one to one and that is 
the question that we are asking really. So, in order to do that, let us take a look at the electronic structure of these molecules, because that would give us a key uh, that would give us a way to systematically understand these molecules. So, as we had described earlier in an octahedral fragment, uh, which is pictured here, we have to define our axes. So, we will use the usual axes that we uh, the convention, the z axis will be the one which is going up and down on the screen and the x axis is the one which is going from left to right and the y axis is the axis that is projecting into the screen. So, you have for you the three axes defined and in these axes, if you have a bunch of orbitals, valence orbitals. In the case of transition metal systems, we normally talk about n d and the empty n plus 1 s and n plus 1 p, which are pictured here. The energy ordering is approximately in this fashion. So, now, if you want to form an octahedral complex, we have to choose the right set of atomic orbitals that will form a combination of molecular orbitals with the 6 ligands, which are coming in the plus x minus x plus y minus y and the plus z minus z directions. So, if you want to form a set of molecular orbitals, we normally end up taking the d 2 s p 3. We take 2 d orbitals, 1 s and 3 p orbitals, so that we can combine them and form a combination of molecular orbitals which will be uh, will, which will be pointed along the x, y and z directions. We are in fact mixing two methodologies, the valence bond formalism and the molecular orbital formalism here. In the molecular orbital formalism, we normally do not talk about uh, hybridization of the d 2 s p 3, but if you look carefully at the ligand group orbitals that have the right symmetry to interact with 6 ligands coming in the x, y and z directions. The molecular orbitals are in fact, those which are formed by mixing the same set of orbitals, which we have used in the valence bond formalism. So, this type of mixing of these two theories gives us a easy way of explaining the fragment molecular orbitals that we are going to obtain. So, here I have for you pictured the d 2 s p 3 hybrid, which is oriented in the right way to interact with ligands coming along the Cartesian coordinates. So, the three orbitals that are left behind that are not going to interact with any orbitals on the along the axis, because they are pointed in between the axis are the x z, y z and the x y orbitals and these are in the crystal field formalism we encountered or even in the molecular orbital formalism, we would call them the t 2 g set. So, the situation is akin to what we encountered in organic chemistry, when we in fact hybridized s and 3 p orbitals on the carbon to generate 4 hybrid orbitals, which we call as a s p 3 hybrid. So, these hybrids are now pointed along the 4 vertices of the tetrahedron and you can you you are familiar with this and each one of these lobes would look in a in this fashion. So, each one of these lobes, which are formed by combining the s and the 3 p's would look approximately like that and they are pointed along the vertices of a tetrahedron. So, let us now look go back to the metal fragment and if you look at it, you get exactly a similar picture. You have a set of orbitals, which are pointed along the x, y and z um, axes. And if a, if a metal complex is formed by combining 6 ligands, each with a pair of electrons and they come towards the metal atom. We are hypothetically using a metal, which neither has d electrons or uh, the no valence electrons basically. And so, we have the set of t 2 g orbitals, which are empty and the 6 ligand group orbitals, which we formed metal group orbitals 
which are suitable for interacting with the ligand group orbitals are mixed and they would have an average energy corresponding to the weighted average of the d 2 sp 3 orbitals. So, here we can interact the ligand group orbitals which presumably are filled and are usually at a lower energy level and so they would combine together or mix to form molecular orbitals. So, these are our molecular orbitals. So, these are our molecular orbitals which are formed where you have a set of bonding orbitals. This is our bonding group and this is our antibonding orbitals. In our approximate picture, we are not worried about the individual uh, levels or energy levels, but approximately you would have a bonding and an antibonding group and this would be essentially the non-bonding group. Now, let us take a closer look at this picture. We have the ligand which has come in with 12 electrons, 6 into 2, 12 electrons and these are filled nicely in the bonding set of orbitals. Now, if you have in addition to the electrons that are there in the ligand group, suppose I have a maximum of 6 electrons on the metal. So, I have 6 electrons which are sitting here and these 6 electrons would fill up only the T 2 G set of, uh, of T 2 G set which is in the middle and it is a non-bonding group. You will notice that we had 6 into 2, 12 electrons here and 6 electrons here. So, we have a total of 18 electrons and this is roughly the origin of the 18 electron rule. When you have more than 18 electrons, you tend to form elect, uh, tend to form complexes where you are populating the antibonding orbitals that are located here. And since you populate antibonding orbitals, you will have weaker metal ligand bonds. Essentially, what we are saying is these 6 electrons which are present on the metal go into non-bonding orbitals do not contribute really to the bonding situation here. And even if you have less than 6 electrons, so if you have instead of 18, if you have 16 or 14, you would still have a reasonably good bonding situation between the metal and the ligand. Now, let us proceed further. Let us take a look at what would happen if, uh, if you had to remove one of these ligands. But before we do so, we must emphasize the fact that this energy gap between the non-bonding and the anti-bonding uh, group of orbitals is prohibitive compared to the energy gap that is existing here. And as a result, usually one does not fill in these anti-bonding orbitals at all. In most cases, you would stop at 18. So, although 18 electron rule is touted as this most stable configuration, you could have less than 18 electrons and still have stable configurations without difficulty. So, if you remove one of the electrons, one of the ligands that have come in with the pair of electrons and these ligands are, let us say you remove these ligands by just pulling them out from the top and the plus z direction, you just removed one electron. Now, what would happen is the following. Let us say we prepared the metal in order to interact with 6 ligands. So, what one of these orbitals, metal group orbitals, which are suitable for interacting with the ligand is now left without a, a, a appropriate combination to form the bonding and the antibonding orbitals. So, it would be approximately at the level where it had in where it had mixed. So, this is approximately the D 2 weighted average of the D 2 and S p 3 orbitals and so, it would be at a slightly higher energy compared to the T 2 G set. So, you have one electron here and what we are going to find is that this leaves a empty, this leaves an empty orbital which is present on the metal atom in the place where the ligand should have been. So, you have an M L 5 complex 
and you have an empty orbital which is present on the metal. Let us go further and think about the combine uh, think about what would happen what would happen if we filled in some electrons into the metal if we have the approximate appropriate number of electrons. Let us consider M n C O 5 manganese pentacarbonyl is a fragment that is formed when you break uh, M n 2 C O 10 and if you break M n 2 C O 10 if you split it in half you would end up with uh, M n C O 5 species which would have exactly the same structure as what we have drawn here. And this fragment M n C O 5 fragment would have 7 d electrons. You remember that the electronic configuration of manganese which is usually written as uh, as d 5 s 2 and in the in the free state would in fact in a chemically in a chemically significant environment would switch over to d 7 and you would end up with the arrangement of filling in the t 2 g set with 6 electrons and the empty orbital that was available for the ligand had it been there is now sitting in this one orbital which is at a slightly higher energy level. Notice that when you form M n 2 C O 10 we would have simply combined this this one electron that is present on the M n C O 5 fragment with the other M n C O 5 fragment to form M n 2 C O 10. Now, we have these 7 electrons and you have a single electron on the manganese fragment. Consider the situation which you have when you remove one ligand from methane. If you remove one ligand, one hydrogen atom from methane, you end up with a CH 3 radical and the CH 3 radical has a sp 3 hybrid present on the carbon and the sp 3 hybrid has a single electron present in it. And that single electron which is present on the methyl group can be compared with the M n C O 5 fragment which also has a single electron. Notice some more similarities which are present between the two groups. What you have on the on the right hand side is the methyl group and the methyl group has got a single lobe and the manganese M n C O pentacarbonyl has also got a single lobe which is a sp 2 sp 3 d 2 hybrid now, but the forms are reasonably similar. Now, these are schematic diagrams. What about the actual diagrams? We should let us take a look at them also. Before we do that, we should tell ourselves that these are not isostructural fragments. The manganese has got 5 groups, the carbon has got only 3. Neither are they isoelectronic. The carbon has has got only 7 electrons now and the manganese has got 7 valence electrons and the there are more electrons on the manganese and so the carbon and the manganese cannot be considered as isoelectronic fragments. Nevertheless, the total valence electrons that are present if you consider the consider the carbon and the manganese they appear to be similar. What we have forgotten is that there are 5 bonding electrons which we have omitted and here we have 6 bonding electrons which we have counted. So, the, uh, the total number of electrons on manganese should really be 17 and this one should be 7. So, we are not talking about isoelectronic fragments. A comparison of the frontier orbital tells us now that the two have a similar form. They have a similar lobe and if you look at the results of a computation, you really find that there is a large lobe on the manganese which uh, as you if you think of a com of the fragment as being oriented in this fashion. Here uh, you have contributions from all the carbonyls also to a small extent. So, the the highest occupied molecular orbital which was having the single electron in fact looks as if it has got a large lobe which is pointed away from the M n C O 5 fragment, but it is very similar to what you have on the methyl group which also had a single lobe. 
only difference seems to be the small contributions from the carbon monoxides as well. So, if you look at the methyl radical, if you look at the methyl radical, we can ask the question since the lobes are similar, would they have similar reactivity? Here we have the methyl group, what does it do? It combines with another methyl radical and forms ethane. And a very similar situation happens with M N 2 C O 10. You take two M N C O 5 fragments, both of them have got one electron each on the highest tocobite molecular orbitals. They can form a manganese manganese bond. Here on the organic side, you form a carbon carbon bond. There the two similarities seem to be fairly striking. Now, we can also ask the question, can you combine the metal instead of combining with the with another metal, can it combine with a can the metal combine with the metal. So, the uh, answer is yes and we have this familiar molecule M N C O 5 M E, which we used for looking at insertion reactions. So, methyl pentacarbonyl manganese is a perfectly stable molecule which is formed by combining these two radicals, the organic fragment which is on your right and the metal fragment on the left. You can combine these two just like two methyl radicals would combine and form M E M N C O 5. So, you can see that there is a lot of similarity between the two in terms of reactivity, in terms of the behavior and we can in fact, uh, go ahead and look at them as isolobal uh, fragments which have similar reactivity. Now, if we if we do this further, let us take let us let us push this uh, analogy a little further. Let us go back to our drawing board and look at uh, the fragments that would be formed if you remove two ligands from the octahedral complex. So, here is the bunch of orbitals which are generated for the six metal group orbitals as if six ligands are going to come in. But now, if we remove two of them, if we bring only four ligands and these four ligands we are going to bring in on along these axis, along these axis. So, we do not bring in one which is away from you on on the y axis and one on the right side of the x axis. So, the plus x axis and the minus y axis do not have ligands now. So, what will happen is that the four orbitals initially there were six orbitals and these are pictured here and then we looked at the fragment which would be formed when we removed one ligand and that is a fragment here we are left with an orbital which did not have a suitable combination. Now, we are having two orbitals along the minus y axis and the plus x axis. They do not have a suitable partner to interact with and as a result, there will be four ligand group orbitals interacting with the four metal group orbitals which are pictured here, but two metal orbitals are left without a partner to interact with and form molecular orbitals. So, again they will be left in the state where they have no bonding or anti bonding. They will be similar to the non bonding orbitals which are formed by the T 2 G set. So, here we have the familiar T 2 G set which is uh, left in the non bonding state and we had six metal group orbitals out of which four of them have now bonding orbitals and anti bonding orbitals, but two are still left in a non bonded state. Now, before we proceed further, the two orbitals which are in the non bonded state have in fact, they are in fact, uh, equi energetic if they are hybridized together, but in the molecular orbital formalism, you will note that even in the case of water, where we are used to writing two fragment, two MOs or two lone pairs, sorry, 
two lone pairs on the oxygen which are identical we call them the rabbit ear lone pairs these lone pairs are called rabbit ear lone pairs and they are from the V s valence formalism valence these are the valence orbitals which have two pairs of electrons which are pointed in the tetrahedral direction. But if you look at the M O formalism, we will end up with a sigma pair of electrons let me write it for convenience in this fashion I write it on the plane of the screen. So, that I have two hydrogens in the plane of the screen and the third orbital which is called the sigma lone pair is present on the lone on the plane of the screen as well. Now, perpendicular to the plane of the screen I will have another lone pair which is going in and out of the plane of the screen and now I would have now I would have a p type orbital or a pi type lone pair. So, here is here are two types of lone pairs one is a sigma type lone pair and another is a pi type lone pair. So, the molecular orbital formalism in fact distinguishes these two electron pairs and it suggests that there would be two different energy levels for them one would be lower than the other. In fact, if you do uh, spectroscopy electron spectroscopy on a water molecule you would find out that in fact there are two different energy levels for the non bonded lone pairs. So, although the valence bond formalism which we have used to derive the uh, rabbit ear lone pairs on water are very common and very familiar to us the actual situation in an isolated water molecule is that there are two different lone pairs one is a sigma lone pair and the other is a pi lone pair. And so, a very similar situation happens when you look at the two uh, the rabbit ear valence orbitals which are present in the M L 4 system. The M L 4 system has got a rabbit ear group of orbitals which have to be split into a sigma and a pi set of orbitals. So, these are the sigma and pi set of orbitals and that is the reason why they have different energies and these different energies come out uh, it, they are very slightly different in energy, but both are empty. Now, you see that the M L 4 fragment should have some analogy with the fragment which is present in the groups that we formed after removing hydrogens from methane. So, let us take a look at the Mendeleev's abacus and see what would be similar to the methylene group that is formed by removing two hydrogens on the methane. You remove two carbon monoxides on the M L 6 fragment and if you want to have two electrons on the two orbitals which are the valence orbitals now for the iron carbonyl fragment you would need eight valence electrons. And we know that the metal which has got eight valence electrons is actually iron tetracarbonyl and you would have iron has got d 8 configuration. So, the T 2 G set would be filled with six electrons and one electron would be available for the two molecular orbitals which are the two molecular orbitals which are present uh, which have the symmetry of a 1 and b 2. So, you have the same and or a similar situation for the C H 2 the methylene fragment except that the energy of the sigma lone pair is lower in the case of the C H 2 fragment whereas, in the F E C O 4 fragment you have the, the pi type uh, the p type orbital which is lower in energy. Nevertheless, because these two orbitals are reasonably close in energy you end up with the electronic configuration that is very similar for the two fragments. So, the two lobes which we derived for C H 2 and F E C O 4 in the valence bond formalism would have two rabbit ear type lone pairs or two rabbit ear type orbitals 
which have a filled with one electron each and in the molecular orbital formalism we would have to split them as sigma and pi type uh, and they have the symmetry of a 1 and b 2 and this is the way in which they are filled with one electron each. So, these two fragments also appear to be similar and the C H 2 the methylene fragment is now considered to be isolobable with the iron tetracarbonyl. So, notice the symbol that professor Hoffman has suggested for these two groups. They are it is a double headed arrow with an orbital lobe below the double headed arrow. So, this is a, a double headed arrow which we have and the orbital lobe is is attached to the lower half of the double headed arrow suggesting that the two fragments have got similar lobes in the valence orbitals of course. So, let us take a look at the iron uh, tetracarbonyl species and the type of molecular orbitals they have. Here I have shown for you the valence orbitals which are available for F E C O 4 and this now has got a very large lobe which is the sigma lobe uh, which, which corresponds to the sigma type interaction on the iron and, and that is pointed exactly midway between the two carbon monoxide units which are which are like this one coming towards you and the other going away from you and two carbon monoxides are up and down on the plane of the screen and this lobe is in the plane of the screen also, but it is a large uh, lobe which has got only one face and so it is a sigma type orbital. This is a sigma type orbital whereas, the other orbital which we have has got a nodal plane which is passing in between the along the two carbon monoxides which are along the plus z and the minus uh, z uh, axis and so you have a nodal plane passing along the x z plane and so you have two lobes one is shaded green and the other is shaded red so this one is red so that's the those are the two MOs that are present on the F E C O 4 fragment. And so, now this is very similar to the p orbital that would have been present on the carbon and the S p 2 hybrid which would be present on the carbon in a sigma type orbital. So, the F E C O 4 fragment and the methylene fragment are very similar. Now, let us take a look at the reactivity. If you take two methylenes, they would combine together they would combine together to form ethylene. Now, it turns out that ethylene is quite stable. A similar situation happens when you take the iron uh, uh, tetracarbonyl, it can form diiron octacarbonyl, but unfortunately this species which has the iron iron double bond is not as stable as the one which has a carbon carbon double bond. Now, you know that in most systems when you have a heavy metal or a heavy um, atom other than the first row atom, they do not form strong multiple bonds. And so, also the iron iron bond is weaker and it is not as stable as ethylene itself. But nevertheless, this is a reactive intermediate that is formed in the re reaction of Fe 2 C 9 which is the stable molecule. It can in fact, react with a methylene a carbene fragment and that is what is pictured for you in the center of the screen. You have a carbene complex of F E C O 4 that is the simplest carbene complex that you can form with a C H 2 group and a iron tetracarbonyl unit. So, there are differences between the two although the two are supposedly isolobable you do have some similarities. You can combine them together to form you can combine the organic fragment and the inorganic fragment together to form a iron tetracarbonyl complex which is complex to CH 2 which is a prototypical car carbene. And the Fe 2 CO 8 the unsaturated molecule is more reactive than ethylene itself. Now, it is possible for us to have 
apart from this reactivity it is possible to have more fragments which can be compared and I have for you in this uh, in this in the screen a series of molecules which can be compared to the organic fragment. Suppose you take three carbenes and put them together you would form a cyclopropane that is a saturated cyclopropane that we are talking about. Now, if you replace one of the methylene units with an FeCO4 unit, then you end up with a iron tetracarbonyl olefin complex. Notice that although it is written in this fashion, what we are really talking about is the olefin complex of iron tetracarbonyl. So, this is the complex this is the way we normally write uh, iron tetracarbonyl species you have where each of these lines is capped with the carbon monoxide and you we normally write it to the center of the carbon carbon bond. But if you wrote it as if the two carbons are directly bonded to the iron which in fact is the way in which they are interacting then you would end up with the form where a cyclopropane has been formed by an isolable replacement. So, there is yet another way in which we can go from the inorganic side. Let us take Fe 2 CO 8 and treat it with a carbene. Then we end up with a carbene complex where a methylene group is bridging a Fe 2 CO 8 unit. And lo and behold this is exactly the same thing that we have done except ex this is exactly the same type of a replacement we have done. Now, instead of replacing two, instead of replacing one FeCO4 unit, we have replaced two FeCO4 unit from the cyclopropane. So, from cyclopropane, we have added two iron tetracarbonyl units and we have obtained the olefin complex or the methylene carbene complex. So, now we have a replacement of all the three carbons on cyclopropane with uh, FeCO4 unit and then you would obtain Fe3CO12. Unfortunately, Fe3CO12 has got this structure where there are bridged carbon monoxides. So, it looks different, but however, remember you can just replace iron with ruthenium and ruthenium with osmium and if you do that, you get OS3CO12. OS 3 CO 12 is extremely similar to the cyclopropane unit. So, we have gone from one metal cyclopropane, this is a organic cyclopropane, from that we have gone to a one metal cyclopropane to a two metal cyclopropane and then we have gone to a completely inorganic cyclopropane system. So, the analogy can even be extended further, you can replace a methylene group with a simple replace the two hydrogens on the methylene group with another um, molecule. So, here I have for you a tin atom which is in fact bridging two C 2 Fe 2 CO 8 units on either side. So, imagine this to be a CH 2 group initially and then the two hydrogens have been replaced with a uh, ethylene molecule, the inorganic part of the ethylene molecule. So, you would end up with Fe 2 CO 8 unit interacting with this carbon, the central carbon. And since carbon can be replaced with tin, silicon and then subsequently tin and then replaced by lead, you have here an inorganic analog of the spiro compound which we would have formed if we just combined two cyclopropanes together. So, this is a spiro compound that we are the organic analog and this is the inorganic spiro compound that is formed by replacing the central carbon which we had here with a tin atom. So, now let us go on to the ML 3 fragment. The ML 3 fragment uh, could be formed by simply re removing three ligands from the ML 6 fragment that we are familiar with now. So, let us remove them and let us take them out from plus z plus x and the minus y axis 
and so we would have the fragment that is pictured for you on the top here. And this fragment can be rotated in such a way that it has a C 3 axis which is now pointed along the z, z plus z of the Cartesian framework. So, this is the so, we want it to be pointed in such a way that you have a C 3 axis uh, passing through the plus z axis. Usually, the plus z axis is considered the principal axis and so, we rotate it. So, that we have a proper orientation of the ML 3 fragment. Now, if we have 3 electrons present in them, we would have a C H fragment something equivalent to a C H fragment. So, here is the organic analog and I have a hydrogen here. So, this hydrogen has got 3 uh, three lobes which are pointed along the places where the other 3 hydrogens would have been in methane. And so, these 2 turn out to be looking very similar except for one striking difference. The methane fragment, the C H fragment which was formed from methane has got 3 lobes and it has got a single uh, a single hydrogen which is pointed downward. Whereas, the 3 carbonyl fragment that we have here has got 3 legs and 3 orbitals pointed upward, but the 3 lobes seem to be looking very similar. Let us now see what would happen if we if we want to form the analogous fragment for the carbine. So, this is C H or the C R unit which has got 3 electrons. So, we want 1 electron for each one of these orbitals and if you remember the T 2 G set has to be filled with 6 electrons and we want 3 electrons on the 3 valence orbitals which are available for the M L 3 fragment. If we have to fill up with 9 electrons, it has to be a D 9 system. So, a D 9 M L 3 would be tri cobalt octa tri carbonyl cobalt. So, C O C O 3 is the right fragment which would have 3 electrons available for interacting with other fragments. So, <coughs> just as we explained in the previous instance, we had the inversion of the symmetric orbital and the uh, unsymmetrical orbital. Here also the degenerate set of orbitals which we have on the carbon framework will be higher in energy. They are 2 p orbitals and this is the hybridized orbital which we have at a slightly lower energy. Similarly, here also you would have to split them into a, a and a E set of orbitals and these orbitals would have the form that I have shown here for you. Here is the uh, form of the metal orbitals. You will if you were orienting it orienting the C O C O 3 unit such that one of these one of these carbon monoxides fall on the x z plane, then the nature of these orbitals would look, look somewhat like the p orbitals on the cobalt. So, this is what you would have a symmetric orbital which is pointed along the z axis and a p y and a p x set of orbitals. So, a very similar situation happens in the C H also the C H fragment. So, the D 9 M L 3 fragment and the C R group turn out to be very similar. So, now let us take a look at the uh, at the actual molecular orbitals which have been computed for tri carbonyl cobalt. Here are the 3 orbitals which are present. The carbon monoxide the 3 carbon monoxides have been oriented in a slightly tilted fashion. So, that you can see the lobes a little better. There are 2 uh, there are 2 p type orbitals on uh, on the cobalt and they are marked lomo, lumo and homo, but in fact the 3 orbitals are are filled in this fashion just depends on the electron count that we have used for doing the calculation. So, here I have for 
for you the lowest energy orbital has got has got a single lobe which is symmetric and it is pointed along the z axis and that is rotated in such a way. So, that you can see it fully it has got only one face uh, in the whole in the whole side that is pointing towards you and you have two p type orbitals where you have a red lobe and the a, a green lobe and a red lobe and so these two whether it is pointed they are oriented in such a way that you have a nodal plane and so they have they are degenerate and they have pi type symmetry for interaction with other fragments so just like you have in the case of uh, carbon the carbine unit you have a system which has got sigma and pi type interactions now let's take a look at tetrahedrane which would be the fragment that is formed by combining four carbine units ch fragments and that's tetrahedrane you can replace each one of these fragments with a tricarbonyl cobalt unit that's the inorganic analog of ch so you have if you if you form a cyclopropenyl unit cyclopropenyl compound and that can be complexed with cobalt tricarbonyl. So, COCO 3 is a piano stool complex which has been um, inverted. So, the piano stool is in the bottom now and the COCO 3 units are on the top. I can replace two of them and so this is my alkyne complex. So, this is my alkyne complex where I have CO2 So, where I have a CO2 CO6 unit interacting with an alkyne and the axis of the alkyne is perpendicular to the axis of the cobalt cobalt bond. So, here is an alkyne complex, here is a cyclopropenyl complex which is a 3 carbon fra uh, fragment that is interacting with the cobalt and now we have made it uh, in an inverted stool structure and you can also have 3 cobalt atoms it is a tri cobalt nonacarbonyl complex which is capped with the carbine. So, here you have 3 cobalt units which are capped with the carbine and the finally the completely inorganic analog of tetrahedrane is the IR 4 CO 12 unit that is pictured here. So, you can see very clearly that each one of these fragments each one of these carbine fragments which are present in tetrahedrane has already been replaced in in organometallic chemistry and the equivalent structures have been made and characterized. So, it is possible to understand some of these complex structures as simple combinations of isolable fragments. So, we have seen that the CH 3 fragment can be equated to a D 7 ML 5 you can equate the D 8 M L 4 with the C H 2 and the D 9 M L 3 with the C H fragment. So, each one of these is an isolable uh, replacement. Now, if you removed uh, other if you generate other geometries you would end up with different structures and these also have isolable equivalents. Now, we are going to look at at least 2 examples where we can have such replacements. Now, imagine the scenario when we have 2 ligands in the trans plus z and minus z axis which are removed simultaneously. You will recall that a octahedral complex is sometimes destabilized and it becomes a square planar system and that is exactly what we are talking about here let us remove 2 of the ligands in the trans position and so what would happen is the 2 ligands which are involved which is the p z and the d z squared. The d z squared are not going to interact and so instead of you of having 
a T 2 G set instead of having the simple T 2 G set you have in addition the D z squared which is not interacting. And similarly, the P z which was mixing with the lower energy s and forming a combination of metal or group orbitals. You are only having four group orbitals and the P z is left non interacting. Now, let us take a look at what would happen if you removed one ligand along the plus x axis. So, notice that you have in this picture first of all the modified uh, set of orbitals the d z squared has been relegated to the level of the T 2 g set. So, you have four, four orbitals which are available for the metal at the lower energy level and I have only one, one orbital which has been removed or which has no suitable partner ligand partner and so, which is left un, non interacting at the ligand or the metal group orbital level. So, that gives you an empty orbital and here I have if, if I have a D 8 system as I have in the case of platinum, I would end up filling up all these all these orbitals. So, that so much so that I have only one empty orbital and that is at the higher energy level. So, P T C L 3 minus for example, is a fragment that is formed by removing one ligand which is present along the plus x axis and that leaves behind a hybridized orbital, a hybridized orbital which is present on the metal and it is pointed along the plus x axis. Along the plus x axis, you have a lobe which is pointed in this direction and this empty lobe will make it look as if it is a C H 3 plus. So, now we have a, as in the case of a C R C O 5 where we have 5 ligands and 1 empty orbital and you have a P T C L 3 minus which is formed from the 4 M L 4 fragment you have a species which has got an empty orbital very similar to C H 3 plus. So, that will also have an empty orbital. So, you have the possibility for forming other geometries and other fragments which are isolobal. So, we have seen here what would happen if you formed from the M L 4 fragment a uh, M L 3 fragment in a T shaped geometry. Now, let us take a look at what would happen if you removed two ligands along the minus y axis and the plus x axis. In this particular case, you remove two ligands, you end up with two orbitals which are hybridized and left empty. <coughs> the two orbitals on the metal are hybridized and left empty and I have, I have a total of four metal orbitals which have not interacted at all. And as a result, if I take a D 10 system, I would fill up the 8 electrons here, 8 valence electrons here and I would have 2 electrons, 1 here and 1 here. So, that sim looks similar to what we had for a CH 2 fragment. So, a M L 2 system on a D 10 metal would look like F E C O 4 except that now we will have a different geometry on the metal. It will have a V shaped geometry and it would similar to my carbene which is a CH 2 diradical. So, a CH 2 diradical is isolobal with iron tet iron pentacarb iron tetracarbonyl and the iron tetracarbonyl is isolobal with my N i L 2 or N i P R 3 2 unit. So, much of this uh, lecture that I have given is described beautifully by Professor Hoffman himself in his Nobel lecture, which has been reproduced in Angomate Shemi International Edition, and that reference is given here for you to go through in detail. Now, what we can do is to extend this analogy and also talk about isoelectronic systems. If you have a CH, the CH group can be converted into a nitrogen as if the proton has been pushed into the nucleus of the carbon.
and in a similar fashion a BH 2 unit can be thought of as a CH unit and that in turn can be converted into a nitrogen. So, we can make replacements of CH groups in by nitrogen and even a BH 2 unit with a CH and a nitrogen. And uh, we talked about sandwich complexes earlier and here is a iron sandwich which has on one side cyclopentadienyl unit and on the other side a P 5 minus. A P 5 minus is isoelectronic with C 5 H 5 minus. So, C 5 H 5 minus is identical to a P 5 minus. This is similar to a P 5 minus group. So, notice that each C H unit has been replaced with a phosphorus and these molecules have been well characterized and structurally um, have been well characterized both spectroscopically and structurally and in the in the solid state and both of these molecules which I am showing for you on the screen have uh, well defined crystal structures. So, this is an interesting system where you have an iron 2 plus with an inorganic sandwich on inorganic sandwich bread on one side and an organic sandwich on the other side. So, the titanium molecule of course, is completely inorganic. Let us move on and this is the synthesis of the titanium sandwich molecule. This was recently published in 2002 in, in a science paper and it has got the titanium sandwich between uh, 2 P 5 units. So, you can see very clearly that this has got a 2, 2 it is a 2 minus charge, it is a dianion and it is stabilized by a 18 crown 6 coordinated to a potassium plus and you have a stable system being formed. So, here is a crystal structure of the molecule with a bond distances indicating that you have a very uh, stable structure and something that can be well characterized both spectroscopically and crystallographically. So, with this we end this discussion about isolobal analogies. What we find is that isolobal and isoelectronic replacements can be done and these replacements allow you to make a wide range of molecules with very interesting properties and understand the type of interactions that are present between the molecules, especially the inorganic fragments because of the type of lobes, the valence electrons and the lobes that they have in the valence shell. And using a combination of valence bond theory and molecular orbital theory, you can readily explain the type of molecular orbitals that are available for these fragments to interact with other fragments.